Hey, good afternoon. I hope uh, you have a coffee and enjoy the, uh, the special kick today, 35 years uh, of uh, this conference. Um, so let me give you a little bit of uh, background about me. Is I, I came to Portland in 1996. And that very year, I got in touch with uh, PNS QC. And I got encouraged by PNS QC through my 20 years of career in Portland area. So thank you, PNS QC. I'm very happy that you are celebrating 35 years. Good job. Um, so from 1996 to 2016, um, I work at Intel in Oregon. I work on CPU performance. I like to look at numbers. I like to figure out why something does not perform very well. Um, throughout the last 15 years, I work as an Intel engineer optimizing software for other companies. Um, here's a list of companies. Uh, Appeal. Uh, Appeal. Uh, developed the JRocket JVM before it was acquired by BA and uh, Siebel uh, building the customer relationship management software and uh, before it was acquired by Oracle. BA after acquiring uh, appealed uh, JRocket JVM got acquired by Oracle. I work with these companies and also Sun. Uh, Sun was acquired by Oracle in 2010 and before that, I was working with the uh, Sun JVM developers, optimizing uh, their software applications. So the summary is pretty short. While I was an Intel engineer, I worked with any company. That company would have been acquired by Oracle. <laughs> yeah. So in 2000, starting with 2010, I worked with Oracle. Um, what ha actually happened last year is when I was analyzing the software performance, looking at data uh, from the Intel side, I realized that it would be much better if I actually work for a co company. So if I can actually get inside a company and look at what kind of performance it is. So now I'm with Alibaba. I work in Hangzhou, China. I'm very happy to be here with you all here in Portland today. So this is the problem I'm talking about. Um, software quality is, in addition to the software testing, agile, productivity, everything we learn about today, there's an additional dimension of software quality that is the performance. Everything works, but does it work fast enough? And to make things fast, um, people like to uh, put the applications inside data center and consolidate them. They want to fit as many applications as possible. In 2012, um, it was mentioned that the average CPU utilization in the data center was about 6 to 12%. And um, last year, uh, a Stanford PhD student published a chart showing the CPU utilization in the data center between uh, Twitter and Google running at about 20 to 30%. That means you are only using 20 or 30 percent of the CPU that you have paid for on average. Why is that so? Because we have performance problems when we uh, push the CPU utilization higher. So what is typically done in a data center uh, is running a lot of different applications. Here I just want to talk about one of the many kinds of uh, application is running Java. How many of you are using Java applications? Oh, quite a few. Are you using OpenJDK or the Oracle JDK? OpenJDK, how many? Well, about half of the people using JDK. Thank you. So Alibaba is a big company, but um, we, instead of using the Oracle JDK, we use OpenJDK and we customize it for our own applications. Um, we started doing that uh, in 2011, and then moving on this year, 2017, we have done it for six years. So what kind of Java applications are we doing? Um, here's a picture about what happened in the last six years from 2011 to 2016. 
There's a special day in China that's called the Singles Day. Not sure if you are familiar with that. I just want to give you a short comparison between uh, the U.S. online sales of adding up Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and Cyber Monday. So you put all these three days together last year in the United States, the total sales is slightly less than $13 billion. On one day in China, the sales is almost $18 billion. That's how big that is. And on that day, we are running lots of applications. Most of those applications are running Java. That's what I talked about earlier. We run OpenJDK, we customize it, we deploy on um, hundreds and thousands of servers, and we got that to work. So when we are talking about 100,000 servers, 1% performance gain is 1,000 servers. It's a lot of money. And today I'm going to talk about how we pick up the performance data, how we analyze the performance data, and what can we do to squeeze additional performance of these software applications. So it is going to be slightly different from the software testing talk that you have been hearing today. This is about the software is already running correctly. We want to make them run fast, and we want to run as many of them as possible on a single server. So this talk will be broken into two parts. The first part is about the uh, data collection and uh, some of the data we have been looking at. The second part will be about some of the analysis we can do uh, with the data. Um, there are many kinds of data in the data center when we look at the uh, performance. Um, so for a typical e-commerce application, you can think of that as uh, you go to Amazon and uh, you buy something. So you go to Amazon, you search for a product, you like it, put it in the shopping basket, and then after a while, if you have not changed your mind, you check it out, you pay. And then you pray that you will arrive on time, and usually it does. So, so three things matter in this scenario. One is from the uh, cloud provider, from the data center, we want to feed as many applications as possible on the server. From the customer's point of view is I want to see everything happening right away. I want fast response time. To achieve these two goals, we are going to look at all the data we have to see what kind of things we can do to improve the performance of the software. There are a lot of data being collected by companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, as well as Alibaba. They are all in the same space. We all collect data. Among all this data, you have the response time of the applications. For example, you go to Amazon, you check out a product. You don't want to wait for five seconds. You want it to be done within a short period of time. I don't know. I don't know about your patience. My patience is about 0 0.5 seconds. <laughs> okay. um, there is a challenge to balance the maximum throughput and the best response time of the users. And it is a problem that has been tackled by all the companies, and we are all moving to, towards that direction. You'll be nice. In the ideal world, is we put a certain amount of memory. And memory is very costly. Um, we're talking about putting about 256 gigabyte, or 384, or even 768 gigabyte of memory on a server. So the memory cost alone can be more than the CPUs. So once you decide to put a certain amount of memory per server, and you decide how many cores you want to go with the CPU. So you already pay for this cost. And then, of course, you are running uh, these servers, so you have to pay the electricity bills. So all these costs add up. Now you want to fully utilize the resources you have to do the business. And that is not easy. So one of the things that is mentioned uh, by, uh, by, the, uh, by, the other com uh, by one of the articles, actually, for this one is um, CPU utilization. CPU utilization was mentioned in uh, one of the slides earlier, and it's mentioned by many people as one of the yardsticks is um, 
since you have already paid for the CPU, why don't we make full use of the CPU? So I want to take a step back and look at what kind of data we can collect from the servers. And you can easily do some of these experiments if you have your laptop with you. And you can do some of these things on the mobile phones, but I don't know how to do that yet. Uh, but on the laptops, you can pick up a, a tool either running Mac OS or Windows or Linux. So what we want to get is um, some kind of things are happening on the server, whether those are transactions like uh, your shopping experience or uh, watching a movie, something is happening. And while those things are happening, uh, you observe that there is a measured response time, maybe 0.5 seconds, maybe 2 seconds. And you also measured how many transactions are happening. Um, there could be a mix of different transactions, like some people are just browsing for products, some people are paying for products, or they're just searching for stuff. What we need to do is to put all the data together and try to find a pattern a pattern about what is going on. There are tools that exist on various systems like uh, SAR, uh, System Activity Report on Linux. Perf is available on Linux as well. On Windows, you have Perfmon. So all these tools are available. They work in very similar way, but not exactly the same. I'm going to skip the introduction to R and R Studio. I'm going to save that for ne next time. So system activity monitoring. So, we, so the computer system has four major components. CPU we talk about, memory we also talk about. These are expensive stuff. Um, when you are shopping online, you also uh, access the internet. So there will be a fair amount of network activity. In addition, you may be saving uh, photos or your documents on a local drive. So the four major components that affect the computer performance are really just CPU, memory, network bandwidth, and storage. And we have different tools that can collect this data, and sometimes we have the same tool that can collect uh, different aspects of data. When we drill down to the details, they work slightly differently, but at a high, very high level, they are about the same. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, Linux for the rest of the talk here because uh, we, Alibaba, only run Linux in our data center. So we don't use Windows, we don't use Solaris, none of those stuff. And within Linux, uh, when you install or set up your Linux systems, you get Systat uh, of the package. So Systat um, comes with many programs that you can access to collect the data. Uh, SAR is probably one of the things that I use the most. You can use something else that comes with SysStat, like VMStat, and a few other stuff, like IOStat as well. So, so now you can get a bunch of data, except that they all show up in different formats. And uh, to, I'm going to skip over the, the different formats and the data problem uh, for today's talk. I'm going to go right into um, right into how we can do the analysis. So we got a bunch of data, and the data may not be of the right form as you play with it. Um, if you need to work on this one, and if you encounter a problem, um, just we just search online. Stack Overflow has answers to almost every single problem I faced. <laughs> So we talk about um, uh, the performance data. And then we're going to focus on CPU, because that was hardly, uh, that was, uh, hardly discussed in uh, the recent papers. For CPU performance, at a very high level, we, we want to uh, talk about the CPU utilization, because that's where you pay the CPU for. But within the CPU, um, there are many components, like the uh, cache, the uh, computation units, as well as the other features like hyper-threading and many other things. Um, this is not a CPU talk, so I don't really have one slide for that, I hope. That's true. Okay. So I'm done with the uh, basic stuff. I know I went through them very quickly. Uh, but I want to get to what we are really facing in the current world. 
Um, before around 2007, I believe, uh, most of the computer servers are sold through OEMs to individual um, companies for IT processing. Around 2007, around that time, the data centers are using most of the servers. I don't have a hard number with me, but I believe it's significantly more than half of the CPUs are there. So there is an urge to figure out, um, can we do something better there? And among other companies, Google, again, is the first company to open some of the data in 2011. So in, in addition to open source software, now we have open source data center performance data for everybody to learn from each other. In 2011, Google opened what they call the cluster data. They have a cluster of, I think, about 12,500 machines. And uh, they, in the first release of this cluster data, they, uh, they give you a list of jobs running in data center. They have the timestamp, the job ID, what kind of job it is running. Uh, they hide the uh, exact information, so you, you get an ID. You don't get the actual name of the job. And then all these jobs are, are scheduled uh, on different machines at different times. So they did that, but they omitted CPU utilizations. So there was a need to analyze the data but without CPU utilization, it is really hard to do, right? We, we, we really want to know whether we're using the CPU uh, efficiently. So Google acted really fast within the same year, recognizing there's a need to use CPU utilizations. They exposed their CPU utilization data in the same data set. Uh, the data set is still available. Uh, if you guys like to play with the data, you can still download it. The key difference in the second release of the cluster data is Google has added the uh, CPU utilization number. So on each server, how much CPU is utilized. But they don't collect CPU utilization all the time. Um, they rotate the CPU utilization data across the server, so you get a bunch of data. Uh, within that year, and the year after that, there were lots of papers published about how to manage clusters and software running the clusters in the data centers. So nothing happened for about six years. Just this year, in fact, just last month, Alibaba um, opened Alibaba data set. Again, we talk about uh, the, some of the performance data we collected earlier. So we got this data. Uh, we added one thing that Google doesn't have. Google doesn't do e-commerce online shopping. So they have S, they have search, they have Gmail, they have other stuff like YouTube. They don't have the e-commerce uh, applications we have. So we throw in that piece of data. We also generate some data that is somewhat similar to Google, but we look at one particular aspect of the problem is when you mix the shopping applications with the batch processing applications like Google did, uh, can we spot some performance opportunities that we can improve? So we did that. And this data was available last month, and nobody has published any paper yet, to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. So there's still a chance for you. OK, so, so both pieces of data have CPU utilizations. And, um, some of us think that, well, if once you reach CPU utilization 100%, you use up all the CPU. Uh, yes, that's true. There's no doubt of that. But the question is, does CPU utilization mean that when you are running at a lower CPU utilization, you have the remaining CPU utilization as the headroom that you can consume, to, so that means you can put more applications. Let me turn the problem to a simple problem here. So let's say I have a data center of 100,000 servers. And I look at the CPU utilization that is running at 50% uh, CPU utilization. Am I brave enough to cut the number of servers to half so that I can run other big applications, I save half the cost? 
Let's assume that there are no problems with the software. The software will run as good as well as it can be. There's no inter interference, no locking, no synchronization, no problem with uh, network or disk storage. Thing is, I already gave you the answer is we, it doesn't work. So this is a well-known problem that, uh, that most people realize that it doesn't work that way. Um, but can, do, do we have a reasonable explanation why it doesn't work? Even if the software scales properly, it still doesn't work. So for this, I want to talk about um, a few people that have been uh, describing what they face in the data center. What, they fa what are the issues they are facing with me. So the rule of thumb is, in fact, this rule of thumb actually comes from Twitter. This, is, this was mentioned by the Twitter CTO at that time, is Adam Messenger. He said that let's keep CPU utilization around 20% or else something bad might happen. Well, something bad is people attending a huge conference, they all tweet about the same thing at the same time. Of course, that's not likely the real scenario. The real scenario is something to do with Trump. <laughs> so, so the Twitter CEO in 2011 mentioned that um, he need to be prepared for a surge in activity. And to be prepared for that means that he need to keep the utilization low. So I don't know whether you have talked to really smart software developers. Maybe you are already really smart uh, software developers. You look at a piece of code, and you work with a uh, tester. You figure out what you need to improve. You change the code. Things should work well. And then you find out that nothing, there's no change at all. The performance is the same as before. Um, The really cool thing is the last bullet. Um, it, in fact, it actually happened a few months ago. Uh, I'm not going to name the person or the company. Um, he said that, look, I upgraded my server from this generation of the CPU to the next generation of CPU. I recompile my code. I changed one line of code. My CPU utilization got dropped in half. I did all the work. So he's asking for a huge raise for that. And uh, it actually did not happen that way. So I want to spend some time talking about CPU utilizations. I want to um, I want to make sure that we all understand what that means. So I'm going to keep the discussion at very high level. Um, Again, all my slides have the links of the uh, detailed material. So if you get pull out my slides, you, you can just click the link. You can get all the detailed information there. Um, so about, I think about 15 or so years ago, um, Intel introduced something called the hyperthreading. Um, the difference between hyperthreading and without hyperthreading is a core will appear as two threads running at the same time. It's all done by hardware. Software does not require to change anything. Um, if the software can take advantage of two hardware threads running on the same core, you get a performance boost. And in some cases, you probably don't get any performance boost. Um, in some really rare cases, maybe the performance will go down. Um, the only thing I can remember is um, from the high performance, uh, high performance computing workloads, uh, you may choose to run with, uh, without hyperthreading. For most of the other applications, like e-commerce applications, cloud computing, hyperthreading usually helps. Um, what I really want to point out here is turning on the hyperthreading will distort the data you are looking at. So um, a CPU has many cores, just like your laptop. And some of you have a laptop with you. you, you do you know how many cores you have on your laptop? Two or four? Four. You are rich. 
Most people have two. I think I have two. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, and uh, if you turn on hyperthreading, the number of logical processes that show up will be doubled. So what hyperthreading does is, um, without hyperthreading is what you see on the left. Without hyperthreading, one thread running in black followed by one thread running in green. And uh, they are separate by time. This is the really old computer, you will see this. Um, so it takes a longer time to complete uh, both, so both software threads running on two different hyper threads. This picture illustrates that uh, with hyper threading, the two threads can run in parallel, again managed by hardware. So in theory, uh, the performance can be improved. So if you have a Windows box, like what I have, um, you can pull up Perform, or you can pull up a similar data from Task Manager. You can see that uh, the CPU utilization is going up and down based on what you are doing. In this chart, it just happened that the average CPU utilization is 50%. On the right, you see that there are four logical processes. And they are, some of them is running at lower CPU utilization, some is running at higher CPU utilizations. Without hyperthreading, that's, that's the picture on the top, um, when each core is running at 100 percent CPU utilization, your whole system is running at 100% percent CPU utilization. You can see that the, the green bars fill up the uh, core 0 and core 1. When you turn on hyperthreading, each core is split into two. This, is, this split is logical. They are not splitting the hardware. They just make the hardware appear as two different CPUs to you. So if you are still using two software threads, running on two hardware threads, you will see that uh, within the four logical processes, again, these four logical processes only show up when you turn on hyperthreading of a two-core system. So it looks like you have four logical processes. But if you have just two software threads, each software thread is making full use of the CPU, you'll get 100% utilization of thread zero of the first core and 100% CPU utilization of the thread zero of the second core. And the other two logical processes are not used. So now let's talk about the operating system. The operating system, no matter whether you are using Windows, Linux, Solaris, even your mobile phone, you'll do the same thing. You'll say, oh, I look at uh, the system. There are four logical processes. I see that two of them are fully utilized. I take an average of these 200% numbers divided by four. So 200% divided by four is 50%. So on the left-hand side, your OS will report 50% CPU utilization. What if you are doing something in the cloud? You have some customer data, whatever the customer is doing, and uh, they, they buy some kind of surface, and they're running with two threads, but for the surface they are buying, those two threads are running on the same core. When you look at the whole system, on the right, we have four logical processes. Again, two logical processes are fully utilized. So you also see 50% CPU utilization. In fact, if you look at all the literature, including all the cloud companies, to the, to the best of my knowledge, they will report 50% on the left. They will also report 50% on the right. Uh, if you have seen something otherwise, uh, please let me know. What, what is really, go ahead. This is a very good question. One of them is actually running faster. I'm going to show you an example about that. So they actually do different amount of work. They are running at different speed. Um, but the OS just reports 50% CPU utilization. 
And that was a great question. Thank you for asking that. So what I want to emphasize is, when you look at the CPU utilization number, it can be very misleading because the 50% on the left is really different from the 50% on the right. More importantly, as we want to increase the CPU utilization in the data center, we need to pay attention to this. So to get back to your question, let me show you a real example, how misleading CPU utilization is. You can actually run, run this experiment on your laptop. You'll see something similar. Um, but for this exa experiment, I use a server computer. I use an Intel Xeon CPU with two sockets. So there are two CPUs on the same server. And on each CPU, I have 16 cores. And I turn on hyper-threading. In the data center, we turn on hyper-threading on all servers. So let's do some math. I, I know I promise we don't have math. I think this is OK. <laughs> so how many logical processes do we have? So we have two sockets. 16 cores per socket, hyper threading, so we multiply by 2. So 2 times 16 times 2. That's all the math we need today. 64. Okay, everybody got that. So we have 64 logical processes. So our question, back to the question you asked, is is there a way we can verify the throughput we are getting? and the CPU utilization we are getting are meaningful to us. So we pick a benchmark called SPECJBB2005. It's one of the uh, benchmarks that is easy to run. And when you run this benchmark, it will automatically use up all the CPU utilization of the thread. We run this benchmark, we specify how many warehouses we use. You can think of a warehouse as a software thread that will run as fast as it can. You remember we have 64 logical processes, so we just do two runs. One is we use half of all the logical processes, so we use 32. And the other one is we use 64 of the logical processes, we use all of them. In the second case, we should reach 100% CPU utilization because we use all the threads. OS will schedule all the threads distributing them across other logical processes. In the first case, um, if you run on a regular OS, um, that means not if within a cloud or a container environment, you will also distribute your software threads across all the cores. You distribute them as evenly as possible. So now, let me, let me summarize. We have two scenarios. We run with 32 warehouses and versus 64 warehouses. That means we use 32 logical processes versus 64 logical processes. One very important thing is we don't just look at CPU utilization because we want to make sure that the software is using the CPU to do useful work. So in addition to CPU utilization, we also look at how many transactions are processed. Is the transaction, is the number of transactions processed proportional to CPU utilizations? Okay, he says, I'll let you guess first because the next chart has the answer. How many of you think that the CPU utilizations is proportional to the number of transactions? Raise your hand. You guys have been paying attention to the talk. How many of you think that they are not proportional to each other? Good. You guys are wide awake. Maybe you already have the experience. OK. So let's, let's look at the chart. Again, um, you can run these experiments. Um, within an hour, you pull the numbers. So the first thing we look at is comparing 32 logical processes with 64 logical processes. The throughput we are getting from the workload it's about the same. We're talking about medium operations per second. Uh, on the left chart, we have about 1.2. On the right, we have approximately about 1.2, slightly higher, because of hyper-threading.
Now let's look at the CPU utilizations. As we mentioned earlier, that the OS might report different CPU utilization to you. When you're running with 32 logical processors, the OS reports 50% CPU utilization because we are only using 32 out of 64 logical processors. So the OS did the right thing. And when you use 64 logical processors, out of all the 64 logical processors, we got 98.59, uh, essentially 100% CPU utilized. So comparing just the top two charts, on the left and the right, we see something strange. CPU utilization is not proportional to throughput. So you can look at it from two different angles. If you are the programmer, you will pull up the uh, blue chart, say, I'm smart, look. I make one line change, I run my workload, I save 50% of the cost. That actually happened. And then if you are a data center operator, you say, the, the hardware sucks, look, I double the CPU utilization, I don't get any throughput. So what really, ha what really happens is the counting of the cycles. There is a problem in counting the cycles when the OS is dealing with the uh, hyper threads. That means two hardware threads sharing the same core. Just to make sure we got it right, in addition to throughput and CPU utilizations, we also pull up some other performance counters from the servers. There's something called uh, CPU instructions, the actual machine code instructions running on, the so running on the CPU. And these are the hardware instructions that um, if the throughput is about the same, we expect the hardware instructions are about the same. Indeed, we got uh, 7.58 to 7.84. They are pretty close, not exactly the same. Um, but close enough for us. Uh, if you want to know about why there is a uh, difference there, it's something to do with Java and garbage collection. Again, go into the detail um, some other time. So one thing I would like you to remember from this chart is, if you don't remember anything, just remember one thing. CPU utilization is misleading, that's all. So I guess that concludes the first half of my talk. Am I running ahead of schedule or? You're, you're running, you got about five more minutes, but uh, you can take a break now and that works for you. Okay, yeah. So let's take a break. And if you have questions about the slides, I will stay on stage for a few minutes. Um, I will see you back in? Uh, 4.40. 4.40. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go into a little bit about statistics. Some of you may know more about statistics than me. Just bear with me for the time being. Um, we have data. We want to use um, statistics to figure out if something bad has happened in the data center. Um, so we're going to talk uh, a few examples about potentially that might happen. These are not real data center data. These are data I made up. Okay? I can't show you any real data. But if you want to play with some real data, go to the Alibaba cluster data, download and play with it. So we have some graphs that shows that uh, on the x axis, you have some variable. On the y axis, you have some variable. Um, when you visually look at a graph, right, all of us can do that, you can see that uh, on graph A, there's a point that seems to be out of the rest of the points. So visually, we can say that that is an outlier. Everybody's okay with that? It may not be right, but we tend to feel that way. And on graph B, uh, maybe that X on top may be an outlier, but maybe we're not so sure. So even visually, we have some idea whether something uh, bad is happening. We don't know for sure. The visual is good, except that when you have 100,000 servers of data, unless your eyes are really, really great, 
we can't visually see anything. If, if you plot all the points on the chart, it will be all black. So I'm going to go through this example that uh, we have three data sets. You can, think, you can think of these three data, set, data sets as three applications running on three servers. Data set A, data set B, and data set C. Instead of looking at the data, you can also look at the charts here. So in data set A, we have somewhat a normal distribution. And data set B, we have a bimodal distribution. So they are either very high or very low. In data set C, is more or less uniform. Now, when we pull up the data from this data center, we may not be able to look at all the charts all the time. So sometimes we just get a table like that. We say, well, the average looks similar, so they are OK. Or the mode is different, or the uh, median is different. So we, we look at those numbers. What we really want to say is, when you have a large data set, it is hard to spot a difference. Not only that, even when you don't have a large data set, it's still hard. Let me give you some specific examples. Let's look at these three cases in detail. So on the left, you have a distribution of some values. You can think of them as uh, response time or throughput uh, on a server. And you can see that most of the time, your value is within 5 to 13. But out of the blue, you have a value of 20. In fact, you have one occurrence of that. So if you just look at this chart, do you think the value 20 is an outlier? Is, does it indicate that we have a problem on that server in the data center? We may think so. On the second chart, the outlier is moved closer to the bulk of the data. So we may feel like that it's not that bad. It's a little bit far away, but not that far away. So Maybe we don't know. On the far right, the red data is very close to the uh, group of the blue data. So we think that, well, maybe it's not an outlier. So visually, we may tend to tend think that way. That is when you are only looking at one dimension at a time. When you are only looking at throughput, a response time, one at a time, you may draw some conclusion that you tend to believe that way, but that may or may not be true. In a data center, we have many dimensions of data. So let's see if we pull two dimensions together. We're going to look at these three charts, and then we're going to look in the detail that if you add additional dimension, what will happen? So this is the first chart that Initially, we thought that the red data is an outlier. But after we add the x value, you can think of x value is maybe CPUization. That is the correct CPUization. And the y value could be the throughput. You draw a line, you realize that um, the red dot is actually reasonable. Maybe you suddenly you have more people coming to your website to buy things. So you have more transactions. The increase in the correct CPU utilization will support that. That is OK. So far, so good. All right. Let's look at the next chart. This red data point appears to be with uh, normal uh, appears to be within the same cluster. But when we plot with the x value, again, we throw in another dimension of data, we see that, well, that value seems to be off. So that is a problem. In the data center scenario, 
that means that we use the same amount of serialization and suddenly we can do more work. Again, this kind of thing never happens. That means something is screwed up. Now in the third chart, um, the data point 18 appears to be off. So if you uh, use a simple linear regression of all the blue dots, and then compare the red dot, it looks like it's still an outlier. What if we fit a curve to the blue dots? The red dot is not that far. So the red dot does not appear to be an outlier depending on the equation we fit. So based on these charts, we have, we have seen that, um, first of all, visually looking at the chart can help give you intuition, but it can mislead you. And when you throw in dimensions, it may help or may not help. It's easy to say we can throw in additional dimensions. The only problem is we have a few thousand dimensions in data set. And it takes forever to do this kind of comparison. So I will uh, summarize what we just discussed, uh, discussed is we monitor the, system, uh, the computers in a data center. We use multiple dimensions. Um, then we examine the uh, anomalous machine if, if the data point appears to be uh, out of the cluster. So let me give you a makeup example. This is not real. So let's say I have an e-commerce application similar to Amazon. So I have a bunch of people coming in on a server. At every second, I measure the response time on the, on the x-axis. And I measure the throughput, how many transactions I can do. So I put all these dots on the same chart. Again, the x-axis is the response time. The y-axis is the throughput. So once you have data like this, um, you can apply some kind of a clustering method. And you can form a cluster and locate the outlier if they are not within the same cluster. Uh, many clustering methods can be used. Um, I don't have a strong preference of any one of them. Um, some of you might like to use k-means. It's good. Uh, some of you may like to use something else that is OK, too. Um, to me, the biggest problem of clustering is the computing of the distance of the metrics, right? Uh, in a data center, sometimes the, metric, the, uh, com the performance metrics cannot be uh, compared directly. For example, on one axis, you have the uh, memory usage. On the other axis, you have the network usage. And calculating the distance of these two metrics is uh, problematic. So we have this chart, and we apply the clustering method you like the most, we just put in the data, and, and we keep forming circles using the clustering method. And then finally, we zoom into a set of cluster values. These, these we call the normal values. Um, so our determination of the normal values is based on actual data. And uh, if we have data that is far away from the center group, we just call them um, abnormal data. So we call them anomaly. Do we know for sure those anomalies are bad? No, we don't know. We just notice that they are unusual. Um, so we can prioritize all these uh, anomal data points, and then we can look at them one by one. When we have too many data points, nobody will look at them. So we need to cut down the number of alerts. Uh, that is, um, the num we, we trigger an alert when there is an abnormal behavior. We need to cut down the number of alerts, and hopefully we can still catch the important ones. So we cover basic statistics very briefly. Um, the problem is 
um, we have too many data. So I'm going to talk about when you have too many data, what do we do? We, we can't pull up a table of data anymore. We're looking at um, gigabytes, sorry, ter terabytes of data. I don't know how much time do I have. I have about half an hour. OK. Um, so I'm going to skip this slide. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about map now. Sorry about that, but it's still very little. Um, have you guys heard about uh, MDOS law? Probably heard about it in school, no? Oh, they don't teach that anymore. OK. 1967, so uh, MDOS came up with a simple idea. That is, if we get a faster CPU that can compute things faster, it can only speed up the portion that can be parallelized. When we say faster here, he's talking about putting more cores. And if your software can scale with more cores, you can shorten the time it runs. To make a long story short, as I promised, I will use pictures to explain things. So when you have one CPU, you, let's say you have a job that you run portion A followed by portion B. Portion A takes 10 units of time. Portion B takes another 10 units of time. Let's say portion B is the piece of code that can be parallelized. And let's say you have five CPUs. So instead of using 10 time units on one CPU, you are using 10 time units of, two, uh, of five CPUs. Each CPU consumes uh, two time units. So the total time is 12 time units. So to make a long story short, what we are saying here is if your application spends half of the time in the code that can be parallelized, by using five CPUs, you only reduce the execution time from 20 time units to 12 time units. So it's not that fantastic, right? So that means the maximum saving you can get is 50% because there's always a serial portion that cannot be shortened. That means the whole, in the whole world, the cloud computing is bogus. We keep putting cores there. We shouldn't be improving the efficiency of data center. So there's this guy. He's not as famous as Sam Dobbs. He is looking at exactly that problem. He was not doing cloud computing at the time. He was running some simulations on, uh, in, in one of the national labs. So he does lots of simulations. He used 100, uh, sorry, 1,024 cores. He found that by using 1,024 cores, he has almost linear speed up. That means he, he can improve the performance of his application by 1,000 times. So we look at Amdor's law. The performance gain is limited. And we look at uh, his work. The performance scaling is perfect. So there is a mismatch somewhere. He actually went on to explain that in this picture. When you have more powerful computer with five CPUs, you don't do exactly the same work. You do the bigger workload. So in this case, his portion B will consume five times more resources. So he is doing five times more work with five cores. That's where our cloud computing and data center is based on. We don't do exactly the same amount of work when you have more CPU. What if your software doesn't scale? So what if the parallelized piece of code cannot be parallelized exactly? What can we do about that? In these scenarios, we can break down the performance system into three components. 
within your program, how many instructions you need to run. These are the machine instructions. So let's say you're doing e-commerce applications, you may need one million instructions to run it, and that will be one million. Uh, within each instruction running on hardware, how many cycles you need. A cycle is the uh, smallest amount of time you need running on the CPU. And then uh, you can look at the how many seconds you, you need to consume per cycle. This is the frequency of the CPU that you guys are buying. So for example, on your laptop, you may be buying a CPU that is rated 2 gigahertz. That means you are running 2 million clocks per second. That means within one cycle, you are consuming 0 0.5 nanosecond. So this is what we call the CPI equation. Um, the speed of the program can be broken down into three components. And we can improve the performance of these three components. So one is increase the clock. Wow, that means uh, just buy a more expensive CPU. OK, so if you have cash, that is a good op option. Um, you guys might have realized that the frequency of the CPU has reached uh, about 4 gigahertz, and it's very hard to move it higher due to uh, the heat problem. So if you move up the frequency, the, the power consumption is high, and then it's generating a lot of heat. So the other option we have is um, reduce the CPI. So if for each instruction, we use fewer clocks, then we improve the performance of software. For this one, you can just get a better compiler or rewrite your code or something, so, and you can reduce CPI. So there's a lot of work there um, we can do. For the third piece of uh, option you have is we can reduce the pathing. That means we, for each application you're running, find some way to reduce the number of instructions you need to execute. I just go through these three quickly, but these are um, more related to hardware, I'm not sure. Uh, we can cover all of them in detail within one hour. So, the sad thing is after you do all these things, it may still not work. Um, the thing is, CPU itself is a very complicated machine. It doesn't happen on a linear scale. There are a lot of dependencies on how the CPU is doing things. What I want to point out here is J is a component within the CPU. And there are many different components within the CPU, like the level 1 cache, level 2 cache, level 3 cache, transla translation local side buffer, um, and so on. There are like thousands of components. And each of these components may slow down your program um, for whatever reasons, like they run out of resources. So the whole thing is very complicated. And it takes uh, very smart engineers a long time to work on a single problem. And when we face a problem in a data center, we don't have that time. So we know this is something we can do. But when we don't have enough time to do these things, or we don't like the map here, we just do something else. So here, we are going after something called machine learning. If we have enough data, and um, we know the software is going through different phases, and then we cluster the data to reflect the phases the software is in, then we can optimize each of the phase using the CPI model. So we did that, and we apply a simple k-means algorithm applying to about a dozen uh, parameters. And we did have the problem of computing the, uh, distance, the distance matrix for the, for the k-means algorithm. So uh, we just use a simple, a simple calculation. That means each attribute has one, have the same weight. So those are the uh, details of doing this. Despite we simplified the problem so much, uh, we did find out that the phase detection seems to work. So we can identify. Um, different phases 
uh, each phase is called a cluster here. It's the uh, machine learning technology. It's nothing to do with uh, computer cluster. This is a software uh, phase. And then we identify that uh, this software has uh, four different phases. They swap between these four phases when they are doing transactions. So now we come to a point that math is hard. We all agree, math is hard. Too much math when we're not sure we gain any performance. So can we be lazy and get some performance? This is something that we did try. I did not try it myself. I, I found an intern and say, well, I have a problem. Can you figure out how to speed up the program? The intern say, well, let me try all the combinations. Then I'll find the best answer. So we, we have this application that we have five parameters we can change. Uh, uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. So this intern say, well, uh, the way I do things is um, I start with the uh, x5 parameter. And x5 parameter can take the off or on values. So this intern set it to off and measure the performance. The performance is the execution time. When we turn off, we got 3.372 seconds. When we turn it on, we got 3.38 seconds. So the intern say, well, I turn you off. Is a better number. The intern move on to this next number, next parameter, x4. He can turn it off or turn it on. And by turning it off, he got 2.83 x3 seconds. And leaving it on, he got 3.372 seconds. So there's no math involved. Every time he changes something, he look at a smaller number. And then he drill down into the smaller number. So he keep x4 off and evaluate x3. On the left, x3 is on. On the right, x3 is off. And then we found that x3 is off. We give you a better number. Again, there's no math involved. Just run the workload and take the measurements. When he reached x2, there's a problem. x2 is not a binary parameter. So he has multiple values. And then he asks the guidance from some of the experience Developer, then we say, well, let's just pick three numbers, 150, 50, and 100. So he's, he run these three numbers. He found that the uh, 150 give us the lowest execution time. Again, there's no math involved, even though you see a lot of numbers here. Every time, we just try a few things, and we pick a smaller number. At the end, he's facing the uh, last, choice, last parameter that he needs to choose, x1, he goes to 30, 120, and 70. So he asked some uh, developer. The developer picked these three numbers. By the way, the developer said, I'm not so sure what value to pick, but these are the three I think you can try. So he tried. He find the best number is there. That is the optimal configuration. So this graduate student spent one day or two days, I can't remember. He said that, look, I did great work. I improve from more than three seconds to less than three seconds. So we actually did something else. Uh, we, we, uh, we did something called design of experiments. So we applied some uh, experiment, uh, experiment design methods coming from the book uh, Boss Hunter and Hunter. Now, there are other, many other researchers talking about design of experiments as well. So we change the parameters in some systematic way and we compute the best performance number. So again, we did the experiments. I did not have time to go through them here. We found that by doing it in a, in a systematic way, we cut it down to 0 0.5 seconds. 0 0.45 seconds versus 2.66 seconds. So when we did one variable at a time, that's what the intern did. Uh, sometimes you might choose the variable too early without knowing that the impact of the other variables. So it depends on how lucky you are. Of course, I show the most unlucky scenario to you. But if you are lucky, you, you may get the best number. So, so what we are seeing here is if you have a workload, you have a few parameters you can control, there is a systematic method you can apply. And you can get really good number. Now the next question is, can we apply to 
a large problem. There is a workload called the Yahoo Cloud Services Benchmark. Any of you have tried that? No? Okay. It's very hard to run. It takes forever to set up the workload and run and measure it. So each data point takes a couple of hours. So for this workload, we, we, we run six experiments. This will, take, uh, this will consume about three days of work. And within each configuration, we specify the, one of the edge base parameter called the edge file block cache size. We also specify another edge base parameter called the edge base edge region max file size. So it picks three reasonable num num numbers. Again, we have the same intern that will try all combinations. This time, he's not doing one variable at a time. He's smarter. He said, I'll do all, so I'll miss, I won't miss anything. So he did all. And uh, I think this, is a this could have been a default we were running with. And then he did something like this. He said, well, look, I improved the performance by almost three times. That, that was good. So we asked the question, are you sure that is the best possible number? Well, if you look at all the numbers he has collected, yes, that is the best number. But can we compute potentially a better number from these nine numbers? So we did something called the uh, response surface methods. And uh, based on some calculations, again, you can do these calculations using R or jump. I, I tried both, they work equally well. And then you can compute the uh, maximum point is actually 28% higher. We get 28% higher in theory. So we compute the maximum point and then we use the maximum point to derive the configuration we should run. And then we run the configuration and verify that we can indeed get higher throughput. But this is still a simple example. That means um, we, we have only two parameters and we have very few states. So you can apply a re response surface method uh, reasonably well. Do you have to assume that there, I mean, the, the space that you're looking at might have different peaks and valleys? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I assume uh, no worse than second order. Yeah. So it, I, I can have a general polynomial distribution. That would not work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I make an assumption um, because this is computer. So that usually holds. And the problem is, if it doesn't hold, there's nothing much I can do. <laughs> so, but even if that holds, there's still a problem that when you have too many data, we can't do response surface method all the time. It's uh, pretty labor intensive. So I'm going to talk about uh, a piece of work done by MIT. So MIT has this program. I think it's still downloadable. That they have a framework. They will use. MIT machine learning to automatically tune your workload. So it's smarter than everything I have mentioned. And, uh, and the good thing is you don't need to know math. Everything will be done by the tool. If it works, it works great. But it doesn't work all the time, but so far so good. What if you are running a lot of Java applications in data center? What is the company that does that? Twitter. Twitter run a lot of Java applications, and these are microservices. They want to squeeze as much performance as possible. They do something called the Bayesian optimization. Um, I don't think they have open source this one, not like the MIT one. So this one might not be open source. But the idea is um, they will make some runs, they observe the behavior, and they will change it. So the idea is the same as MIT, but they are focusing on just the Java applications running in the Twitter world. So what we have covered so, so far is um, we have data collection. And uh, even though we pay attention to data collection, uh, the attribute might not be what it seems. For example, CPU utilization, the only one thing you need to remember is it's just misleading. Um, 
Once you have the data, we can do statistical analysis. But when you have a lot of data, uh, it may not be that easy. If you have a chance to change the hardware or software, you can do uh, optimization based on the CPI model. But the method is very complicated, and not all of you enjoy it. And if you don't like that, you can do um, uh, some design experiments. Again, that still requires some math. Or we can go with uh, Open, Tun Open Tuner, a tool from MIT, or some of the approaches taken by Twitter. So, I want to end this talk by saying two things. Uh, I did not go through all the math. I cannot go through some of the details. Um, I am actually given two workshops on Wednesday. I'm not sure you guys sign up. One is how, what we actually do to scale software performance. And in the afternoon, I'm going to talk. I'm going to target the software performance in the cloud, the real problems we face in the cloud, and uh, go through the details about how we handle that. With that, I would like to thank you for your time of staying late with me. Thank you.